and uh, good to enjoy fellowship together. Uh, nice to have someone lead the service, always like that. And uh, you can just concentrate on worship. Then it's uh, one of those things. I think is a luxury. I mean, we 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 thank God that it's a privilege to lead in worship. But it's nice when someone else does it. And uh, anyway, enough rambling. Turn to to one Psalm one two six. Psalm 126, and um, it's a psalm, um, Sowing and Reaping, that's the title I've given it, we're going to look at the the, the last two verses, and uh, there's nothing more encouraging to see a person respond to the gospel, you know, we're convinced it's good news, the best news the world's ever heard, we believe it's essential that all respond to the gospel. There is no uh, life everlasting. It really is a matter of heaven and hell. Nothing more important in all the world. And so it's always encouraging when we see someone responding to, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yet conversely, it's always discouraging when so few actually do respond. When they can't see how vital this message really is. And so um, you know, maybe people we've prayed for for years and maybe family members and friends, and, and yet we go on praying and loving and seeking to share the good news with them. And, and I guess there's always the danger that we can be um, too pessimistic about our nation. There's, there's lots to discourage us when we look, and some of us are old enough to see how we've uh, spiraled downwards over the decades, and, and yet there's the danger we can be just too pessimistic and lack that faith that's essential in in gospel work. So for our encouragement, we're going to look at um, Psalm 126. And I guess one of the reasons why we love the Psalms is because um, they give vent to every possible human emotion. And um, whether whether it's um, lamenting and pouring out our hearts in sorrow, or, or lifting up our voices in praise and thanksgiving, Shouts of joy. Um, it's all there. You know, real psalms written by real people, real life, real problems, real joys, the ups and downs of, of life. It's all here. And so often we can take these words as our own and pray them. So the psalms, um, this hymn book of the Bible, is, is so precious to us. And, of course, there were people, and that's, I guess, one of the encouragements, that they believed that God was the sovereign Lord. Even though some... Um, circumstances were mysterious, yet often you'll see psalms, for instance, that start really in a minor key, really in depths, that change uh, to, to hope and to a major key and to joy. And so all these kinds of things we find here. And uh, yet they were aware, as we go through the psalms, that uh, they were people who believed in Yahweh, the, 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 the God, the everlasting God, and he was their God. Well, Psalm 126, um, only a short psalm, but we, we catch something of this man's passion for God. And, um, and what the psalmist does is he opens, when the Lord brought back the, the captives to Zion, we were like men who dreamed. Um, he's, he's looking back to a staggering intervention of God um, he's recalling this clear uh, intervention of God into the life of God's people. And against all odds, it seems, against all expectations, he, he, he breaks in. And um, um, we, we can imagine the heavy hearts. In fact, we go on a couple of Psalms. Um, is it Psalm 137? Um, we, we get the heaviness there. They're in captivity. This is a people that's been um, pulled away from their homes in Jerusalem and uh, removed from their place of worship, it seems, without hope. And uh, Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept. When we remembered Zion, there on the poplars we hung our harps. Our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of those songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord whilst in a foreign land? And so the psalmist 
goes on. So that's how it was. They were in captivity. It was gloom and doom. There was no hope at all. Yet God breaks in and, and delivers them and takes them home. And so we catch that um, gladness and that joy in those um, back in Psalm 1 to 6 now. When the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. So we, we get something of the, the relief there. Uh, and Mike prayed in his prayer that, that um, the same kind of thing when we're first converted. You know, for some of us it's a dramatic time, I know all conversions are different, but for some it was a sudden thing, we were aware, my sins are forgiven, I'm right with God. Uh, and there was that overflow of, of joy, and that's the kind of thing going on here. But time goes by, <laughs> and we forget the deliverance, we, we forget uh, what God has done, so mightily, how quickly we forget the mighty works of God. Uh, and so that in verse 4, there's that, that, that longing for, for God to move again. Restore, restore our fortunes, O Lord. In other words, the things have, uh, have uh, not continued on that same level. We need to have those fortunes restored like streams in the Negev. And so there's that longing for God to to do it again, and that's often our cry for God to revive his work, for God to come in power, Lord, do what you once did. It seems, it seems incredible that you once moved in power. We see all these church buildings around the land, and you, know, you go to certain parts, you go to Wales or to Cornwall, and see all the chapels that had to be erected because of, of, uh, of God moving in power. And we just can't believe it. There was a time when most people went to church where it wasn't weird to be a Christian. It just seems incredible that that should be the case. And, um, and so the reality is that we're actually having to serve God in one of the toughest mission fields in the world. Europe is so tough, and especially our own land. And, and we feel the hardness and the just the... the uh, the resistance to, to the gospel, it seems, at times we're sharing our faith and we seem, you know, we, we can't expect people to respond to this. We, we forget. And then we hear a report from someone overseas, maybe in Africa or, you know, India or somewhere, Asia, China. And it's just seen people just, oh, that, that's tremendous. And they, they believe this. And we're almost embarrassed that, that to be, we should expect people to believe this stuff. Um, well, so that's the context really, is that um, we're in a, a, a situation that's not an easy situation, and then we get those verses 5 and 6, those who sow in tears, and this is the encouragement to us, those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. So three simple headings uh, as we look at this gospel work of sowing and reaping. Uh, there are three A's, very easy to remember, hopefully. Uh, activity, anguish, and anticipation. So uh, the first A is anticipation. And here we have it in verse 5. Those who sow. So in other words, um, we're expecting a harvest, so what do we do? Well, we have to sow the seed. Uh, and of all the pictures we find in the scriptures for evangelism, it's sowing and reaping. And uh, especially when we look in the New Testament, we see a number of parables and, you know, sowing and reaping, it's the most common um, illustration that, that's, that's used. Uh, we do call it fishing at times, but really it's uh, sowing and reaping that's the most common in, in the Bible. We must sow the seed. The seed is the word of God. We must sow it. And, um, and it's a tremendous picture as well because uh, sowing, uh, maybe we've sort of removed from that um, sort of uh, Bible times kind of sowing where it was hard work. You didn't have any machinery, you just have a big bag, you know, full of heavy seed 
and um, and we picture those exiles, especially they've, they've returned to the land and it's not been, you know, worked for, for years, for decades. And so they're having to go to this tough uh, situation where um, there was a lot of work to be done before they could even sow the seed. That the ground is hard and it's barren, it has to be ploughed up. And so we can see the, um, the parallel easily, can't we, with our situation here. That the, the ground is so hard and stony and barren and, you know, when we think, well, you know, uh, we're out there in, in the, uh, the heat of the sun, as it were, and that's how it would be, of course, we, we'd, we'd go in between the, the physical and the spiritual. You're out there with your bag of seed and it's hot. Uh, and so we, we're in gospel work and we feel the heat of, of the day. And um, it just, it's just so hard, isn't it? We, um, we, we know it must be done, but um, we, 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 we don't want to, you know, be under a guilt trip. There, there should be a joy in this, but it does, it does take, you know, discipline and, and perseverance. And so whether we're sharing our faith in a one-to-one -one situation or in a church situation, giving out invitations for Easter, and, uh, and it just takes faith just to go and do it. And there's a voice that says, oh, you're wasting your time. Remember how you did this last time, and you know, or I've been in churches where uh, you know you go out there full of uh, go to a new church situation, and some chap comes, oh, we've tried that, brother, it doesn't work. You know, there's always the, some people, some Christians have the gift of discouragement, don't they? And you know, you, and you get them in every church. Oh, we've tried. You know, you can understand it because you know. You do get bruised and battered and, you know, you're trying to overcome these things and retain the freshness and the, and the faith. But, but it is hard work. Gospel work is hard work. And it, and it can be monotonous work and get come between the two, the physical and the spiritual here. You know, you, you're in those days with a big bag of seed and you're just walking up and down, up and down, up and down. The same old scenery, the same old... It can be like in the local church. The same old scenery, you know, there's the same old people doing the same old thing, and the same, another year comes by, and there's Easter and there's Christmas, and you know, you've got the Sunday school, and you're, you know, the same old thing, you know, year in, year out, just to keep going. It's hard, isn't it? And that is gospel work. Um, C.T. Studd, uh, one of my heroes, he was a, a lovely. Uh, spiritual nutcase, if you've read The Life of C.T. Studd, terrific um, missionary, but he was, lovely sense of humour, it was a one-off, I guess. But, but he, he, he was a realist. He would, on the one hand, speak about, you know, stirring people up, go to the mission field, and on the other hand, he'd say, no, hang on, just a moment. <laughs> and so he spoke about the, the romance, so-called romance of missionary work, and apply it to all gospel work, really. And he says, the romance of missionary work is often made up of monotony and drudgery. There's often no glamour in it. It doesn't stir a man's spirit or blood. So don't come out to be a missionary as an experiment. It's useless and dangerous. Only come if you feel you would rather die than not come. There are many trials and hardships. Disappointments are numerous. And then he says this, It's not the flash in the pan, but the steady giving forth of light. It's shining on and on that we need out here. And that's true in any gospel work. It's not the, the flash in the pan. Or, or, or sometimes you see someone there, they, they come into the church, they're full of zeal, it's like a firework. Whoosh! Go off like a rocket. Bang, 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 bang. Colors. And he's, a couple of weeks later, well, oh, they've packed up, they're gone. You know, so it's not that. It's the in-season, out-of-season, plugging away. What does zeal look like? It just looks, it looks like keeping going. <laughs> Despite how tired and bruised and battered you are, you just keep going. And so that's why um, Stud says that um, trials, hardships, disappointments. It's all par for the course. And so um, I always get a bit uh, 
nervous when I see uh, evangelists at work or they're trying to get people on into some kind of missions work. And it's great fun. It's, well, there should be great joy in it, but fun, you know, you can mislead people. It's tough. It's hard work. It's not the flash in the pan. You've got to keep going at it. No, so as I say, we, we lament the situation in the UK, but that's where God has placed us. We, 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 we pray for those overseas and we support those overseas. That's tremendous and that's a great encouragement that we can have a part to play in those areas where there is tremendous growth. But where we are, it's pretty tough. And um, so what's the, what's the solution? More sowing. <laughs> more sowing. The more seed we sow, the more chance of a harvest as simple as that. But that's the activity. In other words, there has to be activity. We have to keep doing stuff. But then there is the anguish that's part of this work. You see, those who sow in tears, verse 5. Those who go out weeping. Um, there's always a cost to, to gospel ministry. We feel the, the, the burden of it. We, we know that we know the consequences of rejecting Christ, and um, and especially we feel we feel the burden of, of, of loved ones. We we have loved ones, and they seem so far from God. They seem so hard, and so th this is the burden upon us. We we, we understand um, how important it is, and it's. It's feeling something of, of the, the love of Christ in us and, and, and through us. Um, and the fellowship of sharing in Christ's sufferings. And we, you know, we, we, we want to know Christ's resurrection power, but also there's the suffering part, the fellowship of his sufferings. And we feel that too. It's, the, it's God's concern in us and through us. And at times we, you know, we think, if only, if only, if only didn't care so much. And there's a danger then that we actually pull back and don't allow ourselves to feel the burden of it. You know, we, we steer ourselves and we, we numb ourselves, but in a sense that then we, then we don't get that whole weight that we should. Now, the burden of the Lord, is, it shouldn't be a depressing thing. The devil puts a burden on us, but it's a different thing altogether. This is a motivating thing that keeps us going. Um, but we care about God, we care about others, and so there is a natural weight that we feel at times. Because love, <laughs> when it's rejected, it, it, it hurts. And uh, C.S. Lewis put it well. He says, uh, and he's speaking about the danger of loving, <laughs> the risk, if you like. C.S. Lewis said, there is no safe investment. To love all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung, possibly broken. If you want to make sure it, that in keeping your heart intact, then give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and the little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock your heart up safe in the casket of your selfishness but in that casket safe dark motionless airless it will change it will not be broken it will become unbreakable impenetrable irredeemable so we'll feel it that's what he's saying that if we really love people we really long for them to be saved, then we'll feel the weight of that. And uh, as I say, it's especially hard when there are loved ones of ours. And, uh, you know, I, I think there are very few without a prodigal or two in the family. And, uh, and, and so if we didn't care, it would be okay. We could shrug it off. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But when we realise the consequences, when we realise the eternity of this. And um, maybe we don't allow the portions when the Bible speaks on hell, an everlasting punishment. Um, again, we, we, 
It could, it could drive us around the bend, and, and yet, what do we do? Do we just ignore it? But when you look, what, what is it that has thrust out missionaries out of their comfort zones? And, and, and what is it really that, that is, is the thing that motivates us to keep on going? It's the fact that it really does matter. I remember reading of uh, an Anglican um, minister, and, uh, and he once said this at, at a conference, I think it was, and he was talking to other um, ministers, and he said, men, he said, um, he said, make sure that you organise your diary about this fact, that people without Jesus are going to hell. People without Jesus are going to hell. Then it just helps with, <laughs> with what really matters and what doesn't matter. What really matters is that whatever we're doing, whatever's happening in the church, organise all these things about that one solemn fact that people without Jesus are going to hell. People in my family, my neighbours, all of those people that really matter to us, without Jesus they are lost. So my greatest need is to not think so much about Mike Meller, but to pray, Lord, will you come to me? And will you so fill me with your spirit that the great concern is I see things from your perspective, that I love as you love, I care as you care, and I guess that's what Calvary love is, isn't it? It's that sacrificial love, and it, it hurts it. It's costly, and um, it is the anguish anyway. So the activity and the anguish we see there, and it's, it's, the, it's the love of Christ within us. So I have to ask myself, well, I've been a Christian um, 45 years, and I have to challenge myself, you know, do I, am I still concerned now as I used to be? Have I changed? Have I hardened? <coughs> Um, and when you look at Christ here, and um, he was, we have a weeping saviour, don't we? We had a Christ who actually wept over people. And, um, and it is hard because we tried so many times. And nobody wants to know, we can say, nobody wants to know. Is that true? <laughs> But we've tried this before, and um, I love Amy Carmichael, just thinking of another missionary. And um, the, the, the fact is that um, we do get bruised over the years. And she wrote a lovely poem here, and she's speaking about the scars that we get, and you know, the, when we do these things, and people hurt us, and situations you know, aren't good, and. Uh, no. Anyway, this is the little poem she wrote called Hast Thou, Hast Thou No Scar. She, she writes, Hast Thou No Scar, No Hidden Scar on Foot or Side or Hand? I hear thee sung as mighty in the land. I hear them hail thee, bright ascendant star. But hast thou no scar? Hast thou no wound? Yet I was wounded by the archers spent, leaned against a tree to die, and rent by ravening beasts that compass me. I swooned. But hast thou no wound, no wound, no scar? Yet as the master is, so shall the servant be. And pierced are the feet that follow me. But thine are whole. Can he have followed far who has no wound, no scar? So when we see those verses then, he who goes out weeping, or those who sow in tears. I know we're all different, aren't we? Some, some people are weepers, others aren't, but that's not the point. Now, I mean, we should be moved to tears at times, but the point is, do we feel something of the sorrow that the Lord feels as he looks down on our nation. 
You know, it, it, it should do something to us because we know there's no other hope apart from Jesus. We have a young generation that's had all the safety barriers removed. There's, there is no wisdom, there's no sense now. And we have a young generation that's absolutely broken and anxious and hopeless. And without the gospel of Jesus, our nation has had it. Absolutely had it. There is no other hope. Now we pray for our politicians. We don't criticize them, we pray for them. But unless the Holy Spirit is poured out on our land, we're gone. Eternally lost. Because the nation is men and women, boys and girls, made by God, dying without Christ. Dying without Jesus. People without Jesus are going to hell. So what's your aim here at AEC? Why do you exist here? Why do you exist? Because you are light. There is no other meeting that's important going on in this area apart from here. Well, I don't know other churches. There might be other. I hope there's other gospel churches, but, but this is light. We are light shining in the darkness really matters. And the size of a church doesn't matter. I've, I've got a, a friend in, in Myanmar and, and, uh, and uh, he sends me little um, clips of their meeting. They met this, this morning and these poor people, little tiny churches. I, want, I just wanted to encourage him. I said, dear brother, there's no small churches. There's simply those churches that are faithful to Christ and those that are not. And, and so here we are, and, and here you are. And despite how weak we feel and frail we feel, you know, we are God's people for this moment. And so then let's move on to that third A, really. It is the anticipation, because this is God's work. What a relief. Oh, <laughs> I'm God's child. We're God's children. This is Christ's church. And, and so those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. They who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will, now the AV says doubtless, or I've got the NIV, I don't know why there's no doubtless, is it doubting, I don't know, um, but will doubtless return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. In other words, that no matter how hard the situation looks, there's going to be a harvest. <laughs> Because the Lord Jesus Christ has not died in vain. The, 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 this is the certainty of the harvest we're seeing here. We're not on a fool's errand. Mm. Jesus will see the reward of his suffering and be satisfied. And, uh, and all the, I, 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 Just to go to Revelation. Do you know how it ends, by the way? It ends well. Have you read Revelation? It's great. We win. Well, the, 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 Jesus wins. And the, anyway, Revelation 7... And just to plug out some verses here for this theme, but, you know, here's this um, scene now, uh, Revelation 7 uh, and verse 9. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne, and in front of the Lamb they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And so it goes on, they fell down on their faces. Uh, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honour and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. So in other words, it's the anticipation that God rules the world and the... Um, if the sun rises tomorrow, we have one more day, the sun is going to rise. Not that... Uh, not because Manchester City are going to win another load of trophies, or not because um, uh, Elon Musk is going to make another million pounds, but if the sun rises tomorrow, it's because there are still some to be saved, that Jesus is building his church. Um, so we just need to, I guess, have renewed faith in the grace of God. God is going to say we were singing it earlier, weren't we? And, uh, and the thing is... <laughs> 
if we if if we think that God's going to save because Britain deserves it, well, we've had it. <laughs> but God saves. All of it's all of grace. Why am I here? It's all of grace. Rotten, drunken, lousy Mike Meller. And uh, what was what was there in me to commend myself to? Absolutely nothing. But grace takes hold of a person just as they are and saves them. So we don't ask people, can you improve a little bit and then Jesus might save you? Not at all. God comes to a lousy person or a lousy nation and just comes and moves by his spirit and saves. So we haven't got to think, oh, perhaps if we get another government in, it might be a little bit better and we can prove. Well, no, I haven't got faith in any of them, but uh, poor souls. I mean, no wisdom is there, but... Uh, but our nation, if, we got, if our nation got what it was deserving, then we'd be gone. But, but which nation is deserving? And who in the UK is deserving? All, all of grace, isn't it? And so God brings salvation to sinners despite what they are. He blesses those who don't deserve it. Um, lovely comment by Ian Murray, um, Banner of Truth, Ian Murray. And he says this, that the gospel of grace does not need promising conditions to make its reception a certainty. In other words, we tend to do that, don't we? We tend to look back, I wonder who, who I could likely convert. Um, it's funny, I had a, I keep having flashbacks to my past. I, I worked in um, newspapers, but also uh, as a musician, in my musician mode. I, I was back in this, this dream of mine, and I was back in this particular, one of the bands I used to play in, um, I, I used to do, freelance trombone playing. And in this one particular band, there I was, this is in my dream, and I, obviously I'd been converted because I was, tr I was tr witnessing to these guys what had happened to me. But what I noticed when I woke up is that I was witnessing to the, the nice guys in the band, but I, but not the drunkards, I, was, I picked out the tea drinkers. You should have, some would be going to, well, some was going to the bar, others were going to have a cup of tea. In my dream, I was going to the, the tea, I thought I've got a chance with them. I thought, Mike, you've forgotten that Christ saying, save sinners and go, go for sinners and go for the worst, William Booth said. So, but we tend to do that. Who can I sort of nudge into the kingdom? No, who's the worst? And so, you know, let's remind ourselves that Christ saves sinful men and women. Uh, John Wesley in his journals, if you've read the, the journals of John Wesley, they're fascinating to read. And in diary form, um, May 1742, Newcastle, this is uh, Wesley writing, I was surprised, so much drunkenness, cursing and swearing, even from the mouths of little children. I never remember to have heard before in so small a space of time. Surely this place is ripe for, what would you have said then? Judgment. Surely this place is ripe for him who came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. <laughs> What's Gosport ripe for? Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. So anyway, that's it. So those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will doubtless return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. So let's not become weary in doing good, as Paul writes for uh, in the proper time, uh, that due time we will reap a harvest if we faint not. So those are the three A's, activity, anguish, anticipation. Um, triple A, like the batteries, just keep going. Like the, uh... So um, let's hope we'll be fully charged and uh, <laughs> ever ready, you know, let's, let's pack up now. Um, but so how, what will it look like in this coming week? We need to pray, Lord, will you give me the faith to see that you could save the most hopeless people we have. Lord, those in our family, Lord, will you not come? The God of all grace. It's not up to our words. It's not our words that can do it. Um, just one more little um, anecdote. And when, um, when I was converted, uh, and um, I was the only um, Christian in my family, no one else was, was saved. 
In fact, I remember on my, on my baptism that uh, we, I was baptised um, and um, all the family, both from Gwen's family and my family, uh, came, came to the baptism. And, and not one of them was saved. And they were set on these rows. It was like, you know, like the IMAX cinema. Uh, and when I, when I looked at them there, they all sat with the same look on their face. It was, he's really gone mad now, <laughs> hasn't he? Really gone mad. <laughs> <laughs> and but one by one, great grandma's first, and then my you know, family's. Anyway, but praise God for that. But my mum, God, about tough. Um, my mum was from Liverpool, and she would say, "Oh, I'm not a sinner, sinner. I'm from Liverpool." I said, "Mum, people from Liverpool, especially people from Liverpool." <laughs> anyway, um, God called us away to, to Bible College in South Wales. And I remember feeling burdened that I couldn't witness to mum anymore. I felt a real burden for her and my dad. And uh, Anyway, um, I had a dream one night that mum had died. And in my dream, you know, I, don't, I don't all dream about these things, by the way. But uh, in, in my dream, mum had died. I remember going to the funeral directors and seeing her laid out in a coffin. You know, and I remember thinking, oh, mum has gone to hell. So I was so burdened, I woke up in the morning and I thought, oh, I must write to Mum. So I wrote her a little letter, I said, Mum, I wanted to say how much I love you, I don't want you to be lost. And uh, anyway, I posted the letter. And God used that simple little letter to literally bring her to her knees in repentance. And she repented and, and she phoned up and said, son, I feel so different, I feel so clean. So I thought, God, God saved my mum. But still, those doubts, was it real? And, uh, anyway, we went, we went back, for, it was the college holidays, we went back. And my mum, when we went there, she apologised to Gwen for being such a terrible mother-in-law. I thought, mum has definitely been saved. <laughs> my mum didn't do apologies, you know. But what I'm saying is that, that do, do I, I, I still struggle, do I have the faith I had as a young man? I'd be so, you know, let down and disappointed, but, but let's pray, God, please increase my faith that we can see you work miracles of grace, miracles, or do the impossible. And so we must sow, that's our part. We've got to sow, we've got to share our faith. We've got to ask for boldness, Lord, give me the grace here. There's so much riding on this. Do we really love people enough for them to reject us? That's the question. Do we love our reputations so much? Well, let's pray now. Lord, we confess that uh, even though you've broken into our situations in amazing ways in the past, Lord, we can all look back to days when we have said, this is God. And yet how quickly we forget that you are the God of wonders. God of Pentecost, we pray. Lord, would you pour out your spirit? Lord, there's no other hope. It's not by might or by power. It's by your Spirit. Will you come, Lord? Begin with me. Begin with us. As few as we are. But take us, we pray, Lord, to give us the faith to sow. Yes, Lord, to sow in tears. May we feel something of the weight. But we thank you, Lord, that we are joined. We are yoked with our Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, your, your burden is not heavy or your... It is light and there is joy and we want to know something, Lord, of the power of your resurrection, but also to share in the fellowship of your sufferings. Father, hear our prayer as we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.